Now, we've, uh, a few weeks, we've been looking through some of the stories in Daniel. And we saw this kid and his three friends having been brought from Jerusalem after Israel was defeated by the Babylonians. They were dragged off. Their families were probably killed, executed. And these kids were from the upper crust of the Hebrew society. They were about 15 years old, probably. They were taken to Babylon because they were smart, good-looking, healthy kids. And they were forced into the Babylonian university to learn the culture and the language of the Babylonians. And we looked at that, and when we looked at chapter 1, we saw that those kids, even though they were learning the culture and, and all the liberal arts of that area, they still maintained their identity and their faith, even as young kids. Incredible young men. Incredible. We also saw when Nebuchadnezzar got all full of himself and decided to make a statue 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, solid gold, and uh, wanted everybody to bow down and worship it when the band played. You know, they had, the, they had the, the whole thing going, and everybody was supposed to bow down and worship. But three of these Jewish boys wouldn't do it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't do it. And so they took, they took the penalty. And they were very bold with Nebuchadnezzar. King, we want you to understand this. We're not going to bow down. He had never, nobody ever said no to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nobody, and lived. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. And um, our God is able to rescue us from the fiery furnace, and even if he doesn't, we're not doing it. <laughs> I love these kids. Well, the stories go on and on. Well, now we find Daniel in chapter 6, Probably the most famous Bible story of all. Um, you probably learned it when you were a little kid. If this is your first time, great. Glad, to, glad, to, glad to, uh, that you're, you're paying attention to this today because this is an incredible story. Babylon fell. Darius of the Medes took over. And it says in chapter 6, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. They're like governors. And three, and, and three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. And the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and satraps by his exceptional quality 
that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. That's prime minister, okay? At this, the administrators, the satraps, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in, in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt, crooked, or negligent, lazy. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it was something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king, and they said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. That's not true, because they didn't tell Daniel. But anyhow, okay, never mind, moving along. Um, they have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during this next 30 days except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. But as he had, just as he had done before, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed and was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. He knew right away he'd been played by these clowns. The men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no degree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And a stone was brought, placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles. Boy, that sounds like something familiar that we talked about last week, doesn't it? It does. So that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. And at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called out to Daniel with an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, <laughs> May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Okay, now put on, steal yourself for this next section. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. I mean, this was a brutal world, you guys. By the way, it's still this brutal in a lot of places. We're just here, right? We're blessed to live in America. Before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. 
He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Okay, let me, give, let me tell you. Daniel was brought here when he was 15 years old. 66 years later is when the Medes and Persians took over Babylon. Do the math. Daniel's 80 years old. Can you see him in his robes and his turban? Honored among the intellectuals there. The generations that he had taught. The men and women who had come to put their trust in the God of Israel, Yahweh, the living God. It had to be incredible. All those years. I'll tell you, he, um, he wasn't done. Even at 80. Now, back what was life expectancy then? He was like 110 now, right? When it comes to, when you start doing, figuring in health care and all the rest of it. And he wasn't done, even at 80 years old. I was driving by the old Sunnyvale Chapel, which is now Grace Chapel. They were having a garage sale. I went into the garage sale. And standing in the middle of their gymnasium with all this stuff that nobody would ever buy, okay? Why is it we give our junk to Jesus? Why do we do that? Oh, yeah, here's some stuff you can sell. Whoa, get it. Out. There's a dumpster out back. We keep having people wanting to donate things to the church. And I say, if you leave it here, it's going to the dumpster. Take it to St. Vincent de Paul and the uh, Salvation Army, please. Please don't, please don't leave it here. Anyhow, I'm, I'm sidetracking. Standing in the middle of that gymnasium was a woman named Carolyn Philippi. When I was when I was Debbie and I were just young lovers, I was in I was in seminary and uh, I was the custodian in that building. It's where I met this guy on the front row right here. Uh, he had come in from Washington Island to work on staff there. Carolyn was standing there. She had heels on, little ones, but she had her heels on. Some cool sports outfit. She was running the sale, and I start talk. Well, I embrace her. I talk to her. She still looks the same after all these years. After 50 years, she still looks the same. So I start talking to her, and I said, Carolyn, how long have you been coming to this church? As she walked me through and showed me all they had done to the building since the last time I'd been in there. She said, well, we moved here in 28. I guess I started coming in 1930. That is 93 years, you guys. I said, this got to be a record or something, Carolyn. I saw her during covid I'm at the hospital making calls on sick people with, you know, I'm covered up all over the place. It's COVID time, right? Going in to see, see, see patients that are sick. I heard this clicking coming down the hall, kind of, a, kind of a brisk step. I turned around. It was Carolyn, still had her heels on. She was doing visitation in the midst of COVID at 95 at that time. She wasn't done either, still isn't done. Daniel wasn't done. Can I tell you this too? You're not done. Oh, yeah. I, somebody was telling me the other day, I retired 30 years ago. Okay, well, you beat up General Motors and you beat up Social Security, but you're still not done. Are you kidding me? This is just opportunity for you to serve the Lord in better ways. I think of John Hughley and John and Pam. They're always looking for a way to, to serve the Lord in the midst of it all. Continue to have young hearts. Okay, let me give you a couple of reasons why Daniel wasn't done. First of all, Daniel wasn't done because of who he served. Now, you've got to get this about Daniel. He worked in the, in the uh, administration of the government. He was an incredible man. He had all these large positions, head positions, throughout his life. But I want you to know, he didn't serve these kings, Nebuchadnezzar. Belteshazzar, his son, Cyrus, or even Darius here. I mean, he worked in their kingdoms and did a wonderful job, but his number one motivation was he was serving God in the midst of that. That makes it so you're never done. You're always moving forward. There's, it's, not, it's not your employer isn't who you work for. Let me give you one. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. That's the way 
to never be done, to always be work. Aaron, you know what Aaron Bakke does? He goes and he works, he's in a, he's, uh, he and Tracy have built a wonderful excavating business. And they do all kinds, he's got so many stories about that stuff, it just cracks me up. He's got great stories. But um, he will go and talk to them, to a customer, and that customer will have just talked to one of the several crooked excavating companies out there. And a job that would cost $7,000, they wanted to charge twenty-seven, twenty-eight thousand dollars because the job is in Birmingham and they figure the people have got the money and they're stealing from them and they don't understand construction and they can do this to them. And they say to Aaron, How, why do you come in here and your prices are so reasonable? And he says, because I, I don't work for you. I work for him. I got to answer to him about this. And it just keeps everything going because you're serving you're serving the Lord. It's a great thing. My buddy Keith Flood. I wish you could know Keith. He is one of the happiest guys I ever met. He's so happy I can't stand it. I mean, he just all the time. I wasn't long ago. I was in uh, I was in Finos, and when I went in, um, the owner said to me, "Oh, Tommy, your babysitter was just here." That's Kay Flood. That's Keith's Keith's uh, wife. When she was a young teenage girl, and me and my three brothers were just little guys, she came over and would babysit for us until the night when she came over to babysit for us. As soon as my parents left, we started with the symptoms of the flu. If you know what happens when you have the stomach flu. And she got to do that work all night till my parents came home. That was the last time I think she ever... So she always talks about being my babysitter. Keith, she and Keith are such wonderful people. And that guy has been retired for at least 30. And this guy is so concerned for the souls of men and women. If you meet Keith, you find out two things very quickly. That he loves you. And that Jesus loves you. You guys know Keith. It's true, isn't it? And this guy just turned some big number. It was so big, it probably broke the internet. So his daughter Tammy didn't put the number on his birthday pictures. But it's got to be huge. Okay, it's got to be huge. Um, but you wouldn't know it if you talked to Keith. Because Keith is still going. He is not done because of who he serves. Neither was Daniel. Let me give you Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow, grow like the cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Daniel wasn't done because of who he served. Let me give you another one too. Daniel wasn't done no matter who forgot him. Now, what happens after Nebuchadnezzar passed, after he was off the scene, all of a sudden we see a new king in place. His name is Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar, chapter 5 of Daniel, chapter 5, you will see that Daniel um, was forgotten by him. Belteshazzar was the perfect little um, trust fund baby, proverbial trust fund baby. You know, big kingdom, everything's going great, the money's flowing, you got all the power. So what did they do? They partied all the time. How many businesses have you seen where the parents, the dad, starts a business and works like crazy to develop that business and make it just right, and then when he's done with it, he hands it over to the kids and they ruin it because they didn't build it. And there were no demands put on them when they were younger to produce and get the vision for that business, so it died. Happens all the time, right? In every kind of business. Well, it happened in the business of Babylon. Now, you know, when uh, Belteshazzar took over, he just started having parties until he did something really, really, really stupid. He and his buddies are all hanging out, having a big party, got all the, all the important people of the whole nation there. And it's an ongoing big old party, and he gets an idea. I know what I'll do. Here's something we've never done before. This is, this is cool, man. I know what we can do, dude. Let's, let's get all the gold goblets that my father took from the temple in Jerusalem, and let's fill them up with the latest brew, and we will praise the gods of Babylon. Oh, they started the big party. They brought him out. They did it. And suddenly a hand appears and it's writing in the plaster on the wall. 
At first they thought it's because they drank too much. But it was real. And it wrote in a language that nobody knew, and they were all freaking out. And they had all, nobody, none of these guys knew Daniel. Daniel was still working in the government. He was still training the wise men of Babylon. But they didn't know him. They didn't, he's an old guy. Man, he didn't know. We, we were doing the new way. We got new ideas. But the queen mother heard them all freaking out in the banquet hall, and she came in. And she said, wait, wait. When your father was alive, there was a man here named Daniel who had in him the spirit of the gods. That's the only way the pagans knew how to put it. Call him. And they called him in. Belteshazzar said, hey, if you can read this, I'm going to make you number two in the kingdom. I'm going to put you in purple robes. And I'm going to cover you with gold. And you're going to be, you know, you're going to be running this whole show. And Daniel said, uh, um, your highness, keep your money. I don't want anything. Show me. And they take him to the wall. And it basically said this. God has numbered your days and your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. God showed up and said to Belteshazzar, you're done, buddy boy. You're done. He died that night. That night, the Medes and Persians cut off the water flow into that town, and they were able to come in through the aqueducts and take the place over, and they killed Nebuchadnezzar. Let me tell you, Daniel wasn't done no matter who forgot him. I tell you, I like to go to cemeteries. Well, I used to. I used to spend a lot of time in, in cemeteries. Lakeview Cemetery in Clarkston. It's a cool place. You're up over Cemetery Lake there, and you got a view down of Deer Lake. I'd, I'd go there every Sunday morning, seriously, for decades, just to go over a song. If it was nice, I'd sit on a gravestone and play the tune, make sure I had it together, sort of. And um, I'd go over my outline, and I'd pray, and all of that. And then another cemetery that I like a lot, too, is the one at Dixie Highway, and Williams Lake Road, that old forgotten one there, you know, the old Waterford Cemetery where all the founders of Waterford are laying there, you know, why thousands and thousands of cars blow by every day. One day I was in Lakeview Cemetery, and it was near the time of a holiday, and I realized that in the new part of the cemetery, there was flowers on all the graves. But here, nobody knew these guys. There's a couple of revolutionary soldiers, Mr. Merrill and Mr. Clark. They both served there. I got a bunch of friends. I haven't met them yet, but I know all about these people. I've done a bunch of research on a whole bunch of the graves in that cemetery. Um, I don't go there much now because I'm too close to becoming a resident. I figure I'll spend enough time and soon enough I'm not going back. But anyhow, I was so sad that nobody was paying attention to them. They had all been forgotten. And it was heavy on my heart. And... You know when the, when the Lord just, just speaks something into you, kind of? It just all of a sudden occurred to me that he would say, I haven't forgotten them. And Daniel had been forgotten, and it didn't matter who had forgotten him, because the Lord had not forgotten him. He was still going, man. He wasn't done. What an amazing guy. Let me give you one more. Not only, you're, he wasn't done because of who he served, and he wasn't done in spite of who had forgotten him, but he wasn't done because there's a battle that doesn't end until we die. Daniel's organizing this new government, right? And the king is noticing, man, this is the man. This guy's got all the traits. He's honest. He's kind. He's brilliant. He's a great administrator. I I'm going to make him prime minister. And so what happened? Well, the officials... These satraps, what they would do is they would run the certain sections of the country. They'd be in charge of um, enforcing the law, keeping everything safe, and collecting the taxes. And they all skimmed. They all skimmed. And then here's Darius. He's going to appoint this boy scout named Daniel to oversee the money to make sure the king doesn't lose anything, it says here. Well, they do what they do now. Look, it's like Washington right now. Oh, we don't like his ideas. Let's, let's assassinate his character. Let's have all the news people 
report all these bad things about this person in order to make sure that nobody will support him. So they tried to get him to lose support with the king by trying to find something wrong, and he wasn't crooked and he wasn't lazy. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. Do you know there's only two people in the Bible that we can't find anything wrong with? Joseph and Daniel. They're the only two. Oh, Jesus, of course, but I mean, that, that goes without saying. Everybody else, we see their feet of clay, not this guy. Incredible man. He shows up, and uh, they say, we got to get rid of this Boy Scout. And so they can't find anything wrong with him. So they said, okay, we got to find something wrong with his God. So, you know, he'll, he'll continually do this. So they came up with this idea to flatter the king to make this edict that can't be changed, that if you pray to anybody else, you're a dead man. We're going to throw you in the lion's den. Can't be changed along with the... Well, they came with their, with their evil plan, and they, they played Darius like a fiddle. You know, don't make the mistake of thinking that the battles in your life are over, because they're not. This is Daniel's greatest battle he ever faced, and he was not, this was the, the biggest one, and he was, he was not done. He had some really big stuff that he had to go through before, but his biggest trial came at 80 years old. Years might too. Might come at 95. We don't know. We know one thing. We're never done because the battle's never done in this world. It's never done here. God's plan for temptation with you, the reason he allows it, is to prepare you for the next struggle. I, we were talking about it Wednesday night. Um, do you know what I found out that they do with codfish? When they're trying to ship codfish to market, they thought they'd freeze them, and they filleted them and freeze them, and they lost, they lost some flavor. Nah, that's not going to work. So they decided they would ship them in seawater, and they're inactive for the whole time of their shipment. And when you get them, the, the fillet ends up being real mushy and kind of falls apart. They didn't know what to do. Somebody came up with the idea that the real enemy of a codfish is a catfish. So they started putting one catfish in the tank with the codfish to chase them around the whole time so that when they get to market, they'll be firm and ready to go. I think God probably put some catfish in your life. What do you think? And we think, oh, if they just go away, my life would be... Oh, don't, wait, wait, wait. God's probably doing something here. You're not done. God has his plan. He's got a plan. Because, you know, it's never over. Look at Jesus. Jesus was tempted by the devil, right? He, he fasted for 40 days after he began his, as he was beginning his ministry. He fasted for 40 days, and the devil came to him at the end of that and tried tempting him. And Jesus answered him with a scripture, and he ran away. And it said, the devil left him until a more opportune time. Oh, he came again when Jesus was going to be be uh, crucified, and he was telling his disciples about it, and all of a sudden Peter says, what? Well, this will not happen to you. And Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You're always pulling this stuff. You know, he, but he's not done with you either, okay? So, so what does Daniel do? In the midst of this difficulty, he continues with his routine. He doesn't change anything. Notice something else. He doesn't add anything. So many times when we're struggling with something in our culture, we react to it, we overreact to it to try to show we support prayer and we support whatever. And we overreact like we, like, like we are um, some kind of crusaders for God. Daniel didn't do that. Daniel continued to do what he did. You know what he did? He went to his house. And the windows were standing open to Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Because Solomon said, at the dedication of the temple, if, if this nation ever turns away from me and I have to send you into captivity, if you will pray toward this place, not to this place, not as a difference, not praying to Jerusalem, we're praying toward Jerusalem to remember, okay? And I'll bring you back to this land. That's what Solomon said at the dedication. So he's living that out three times a day. He goes into his house, the windows are open toward Jerusalem and he kneels down. I have a buddy of mine who has a little prayer little prayer closet that he goes to pray in. Nobody can bother him. He leaves all of his devices and everything out of there. And he goes in every day just to talk to the Lord. And on the wall is a picture of an old wooden church in a holler in Kentucky. And that holler is where he trusted Jesus as a little four and a half year old boy. That's what these windows toward Jerusalem are. They just remember 
what God has done and what God is doing. He didn't change. You know, let me, let me tell you something. Um, the battles are coming in your life. They come. They're going to come in all of our lives. We can't not have them because we're, we're not dead yet. Since we're not dead, we're not done. And because of the, the struggles in this world, we're going to still have them. So what do we do to prepare for them? You know, you guys are so amazed at Dave Bennett. He had a big gig up in Petoskey this week. He's been all over the country in these last months. What a gifted guy. And to have these two, you know, have Doris and he, people of that caliber, play together is absolutely just blows my mind. But Dave, you want to know why he can say, what do you want to play today? And I'll say, oh, that's a song you've never heard of. Well, hum it to me. Okay, I got it. And he could just throw down something that's just like, you know, deserves a Grammy. It's unbelievable. The reason he does that is because some days I'll call him and say, hey, Dave, how you doing? Well, I just put in five hours on the horn this morning. I'm feeling really good. You see Dave perform, and he's so free when he performs, he can just go with it, right? I mean, he's just so incredible. You want to know why? Because he put the work in. That's why. When I, when I see uh, Jordan Spieth in the woods somewhere, you know, where, he's, where somehow his ball has gone off course and he's in the woods and he's looking at all this stuff and he looks and looks and looks and he finds a little opening and he hits the shot and makes birdie from there, okay? <laughs> you want to know why Jordan can pull off the shot? Because he spent years in a practice range in practice rounds. And he worked with his coaches, and he did all that stuff. So there's something that we need to do. I want to give you an assignment for this week. I want you to go to the book of Ephesians very quickly. Ephesians chapter 6. Debbie and I, in our devotions this week, have been going through this little portion of Scripture. And it's, it's an exercise that we all need to be involved in continually in our lives, and it'll help us when the trouble comes. Let me read this to you. You've heard it before. You guys have heard it a bunch of times. But Paul's writing, and he says in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Oh, yeah? How do I do that? It says, Put on the full armor of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, what, what do I need to do? What do I need to do before? Put on the full armor of God. What's that? What are you talking about? He makes it very simple. Listen to this. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Every day, we recognize that we have the truth. This entire story of the Bible is true. And I cling to it every day. Lord, I, today, when I'm feeling down, today was one of them. And I just said out loud while I was walking, Lord, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the lover of me. You are the one who can. We have the truth, right? Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness, I am right with you, Lord, because of the blood of Jesus. Remember that. Keep putting it into your life. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Of course, this is a Roman soldier he's describing. Your footing is this. The footing of your whole life is that you are at peace with God through Jesus Christ. No, there's not a war. God is not mad at me anymore. No, I reject those thoughts in the name of Jesus. I stand in the peace of God. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith. You know what that was? A big wooden shield. It was coated with leather and then soaked in water so that when the enemy shot those fiery arrows, you could extinguish them. Take up the shield of faith. I believe this. I acknowledge this. Take the helmet of salvation. Lord, nothing protects my head better than knowing that you love me and you have saved me and nothing can ever change that. And then, of course, there's two offensive weapons that we use. The word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and prayer. Okay? So, if we can live in this this week and tell ourselves the truth. You, if you could get in your Bible or your device and cross-reference a bunch of these statements and let the Bible define what these things are and hold them in your hands and in your heart, 
and in your mind. They're going to help prepare you for what's ahead. It's so important. And having done all to stand. Daniel wasn't done. He was not done. And uh, here he was in this lion's den, and nobody could change it, but there's a statement in the Bible that it says, but God. Have you ever seen that? Whenever there's trouble in the Bible, Doris brought it up to me recently, when it says, this terrible thing is happening, but God. When it talks about how lost we are and how there's no hope for the human race, but God, who is rich in mercy, um, sent his son to die for us and be raised from the dead. I mean, it's a pretty scary situation. I mean, Daniel, Daniel's in the lion's den. You've been around lions? Last time I was, was a long time ago. How long has it been, honey, since we've been to the Detroit Zoo? And I remember walking into the lion's area. What do they call that where the lions are? Oh, what is it? The den, the lions. Of course it is. Okay, lion's den. So, in, so I go down into that area, and there is, a, there is a lioness, big one, with her cub in the cage with her. And I walked down, and that lioness hit those bars like, <laughs> with this roar that just blew me away. Daniel was in there with those guys. Whew! That's pretty scary stuff. But they didn't touch him. Hebrews tells us that God closes the mouths of the lions by faith. So Daniel wasn't done. He's brought out of the lion's den and he goes on to serve this king and the next one. He had, he had to be ancient by the time he died. And he served God all the way. Listen to me, don't stop living. Don't think because you don't have to earn a living anymore that you're done working because you're not. God is working with you and you are not done. You, oh, you are not done. No matter who forgets you, the battle still goes on. Spend some time in Ephesians chapter 6 this week, would you? Build those things in your own life. Let's stand together to pray. Lord, thank you that Daniel was never finished. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for keeping your hand on him and on each of us, Lord. Lord, we don't know what we face. We don't know what's ahead. But we know that you're already there, that you hold the future, and you're going to give us everything we need. But would you please help us as your people to walk with you and uh, to, not, to not think that somehow that the battle's over, because it isn't. Thank you for rescuing Daniel. Thank you for his example. And we thank you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We'd appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now, so if you would, You'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.